Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Walker, Chair of the Department of Medicine uh, here at UCSF. Uh, we're going to do a clinical problem-solving case today with Sarah Dornberg. We'll get to that in a second. Here are the ground rules. Uh, I think you know them by now. If you have questions, please type them in the, in the Q&A window. My colleague Lakshmi Santosh will be monitoring them. Uh, we will put this up on YouTube uh, in a couple of days, and closed captioning is available at the bottom. For those of you who uh, are particularly interested in our COVID uh, topics and COVID grand rounds, just an advanced uh, uh, program announcement that next week, which I think is November 4th, next Thursday at noon, uh, we'll have George Rutherford talking about the state of the pandemic and uh, bring back Paul Offit. Uh, Paul runs the Vaccine Education Center at Penn and Children's Hospital, uh, is on, has been on the FDA committees uh, looking at approval of uh, vaccines and boosters and has really been our go-to person for all things uh, vaccine over the last year. So, uh, so Paul's terrific and I look forward to seeing you on that one. Uh, <clears throat> clinical problem solving case, the learning objectives are to demonstrate uh, the tenets of diagnostic reasoning by applying these principles to an unknown case and to perform a cognitive autopsy, which sounds scarier than what we really mean, uh, to reflect on optimizing the diagnostic journey of a medical case. The ground rules are that our discussant is uh, blinded to the case. Uh, so our chief residents find these cases. This one was prepared by, uh, by Feng Di Sun, who will uh, speak at the end. Uh, but the discussant has not heard about uh, what the case is. And the objective is to learn from the thought processes of a master clinician uh, as we watch her grapple with facts as they emerge and uh, unspool in real time, which is, of course, the way clinical medicine works. Uh, the goal is not necessarily to get the case right. It always feels nice when the discussant does, but uh, that's not the goal. The goal is to learn uh, something from hearing how the discussant thinks through the case. It's about the journey, not the outcome. And uh, I think you'll see that it's important to know stuff, but a lot of it really is the process and the thought process. And uh, we'll have a few audience response questions, but as you go along, we encourage you to think hard about the case and, and what you would be doing and thinking if you had such a case, uh, because uh, we all do. With that, let me bring on our discussant, who is Sarah Dornberg. Uh, and uh, there you are. Hi, Sarah. Uh, so Sarah is Associate Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Medical Director of the Adult Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at UCSF Health System. Uh, she has an active outpatient ID practice. She also attends on the inpatient side on our transplant ID service. Uh, she has been one of uh, many of the folks in our ID divisions across all of our hospitals who have been absolutely essential and pivotal in uh, helping to guide us over the past 18 months and teach us, and uh, I'm grateful to Sarah for that and to all of her colleagues. Sarah got her bachelor's from Harvard, her medical degree from Yale, and came to UCSF for a residency, and uh, then ultimately her ID fellowship and her master's in clinical research. So uh, with that, Sarah, any opening thoughts? I think you said this is the first time you've done such a thing, so how's it feel? Uh, a little nerve-wracking, but thank you for having me, and thanks for the warm welcome. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. And you shall see the case will be presented slide by slide, and then there are certain stop points that we've built in, uh, but also feel free to stop, uh, stop it if you see something you want to talk about. So let us go ahead and get started. A 66-year-old man with a history of supraglottic squamous cell carcinoma and esophageal squamous cell carcinoma presents to the ED with three weeks of progressive fatigue and weight loss. At baseline, uh, he's independent in his activities of daily living, uh, has aids that help with his IADLs twice a week, but now he's unable to get out of bed. He's always been thin, but he's had a noticeable increase in weight loss over the last few weeks. He reports a worsening of his chronic dysphagia and an ongoing chronic cough productive of a muddy brown sputum. On review of systems, he endorses generalized leg weakness and new right back and scapular pain, but denies fevers, chills, hemoptysis, other bleeding, belly pain, nausea, vomiting, chest pain, shortness of breath, or dyspnea, or any, uh, any recent falls. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to ask the audience first for their thinking about where we are at this pretty early stage of the case. Uh, to the audience, what are you most concerned about at this point? Nutritional deficiency, a mechanical obstruction of something, a metastatic malignancy, a paraneoplastic syndrome, a mood disorder, or a chronic infection. And by the way, don't be too biased by the fact that the speaker is an ID person because we are that sneaky. All right, and I will go ahead and end the poll and up oh, there we go. So see about two thirds of our uh, viewers think this is gonna turn out to be a metastatic malignancy and equal numbers think it's going to be paraneoplastic or uh, or chronic infection and there are a few folks who wonder and worry about a nutritional deficiency or mechanical obstruction so let me get rid of the poll on my screen and uh with that we'll turn to uh, to you and i'm happy to go back in slides if you want to see something okay thanks so just to recap, you're telling me about this 66-year-old male who has a supraglottic and esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. Um, we don't know yet much about the treatment history. Hopefully, we'll get a little more information about that. Um, but he is presenting with fatigue and weight loss, um, along with some other symptoms that, that I noted, um, dysphagia, a cough, and scapular and back pain. Um, so, you know, when, when I'm thinking about kind of a new undifferentiated problem, there are kind of a few ways that I approach that. And one of the first things I think about is who is the host? And particularly when I'm thinking about infections, there's a few things that I want to know about. So one is, uh, what is his immune status? So you haven't told me about whether he's actively receiving chemotherapy or immunomodulating therapies for his cancer. Um, but that would be something that's important as I think through what are the possible etiologies if he does have an infection for, for what it is. Um, then I think about any anatomic issues. I think this may be um, something that, that comes into play here in this particular case. Um, we know he has involvement of his oropharynx, and you're telling me about some symptoms that may be going on in his lungs. I'm worried already about aspiration, the possibility of a lung abscess, um, you know, in the setting of chronic aspiration from his cancer potentially. And then I think about exposures that this host may have had. So these are all the things that ID doctors love to think about. Where has he traveled? Is he getting exposed to any weird things like freshwater, animals, um, sexual contacts, sick contacts, TB contacts? I'm not sure those will play into this uh, particular case. So that's kind of the thinking about the host. Uh, and then I like to think about what is the syndrome that we're, what, what is the syndrome that we're talking about here? We're still pretty undifferentiated, um, but you know, I mentioned I'm worried about his lung causing, you know, potentially causing something. You mentioned some scapular pain. Sometimes that can be referred from a spleen or a liver lesion, you know, potentially an abscess, a malignancy there. Um, and then, you know, fatigue and weight loss is, is pretty nonspecific. Um, and then you mentioned leg weakness, which may just be deconditioning, but also need to consider neurologic involvement. And then the kind of last thing, which is the most fun for us in ID, is thinking about what is the bug. Um, and it may be a little early to start thinking about this. Um, the first thing I always do is say, is it an infection or not? So, you know, there's always a non-infectious differential. I won't go into that. But then once you kind of hone in on an infection, we in ID like to think about, is it bacterial? Is it fungal? Is it parasitic? Is it viral? Is it mycobacterial? So once you kind of start to get a sense of the syndrome and the host, you can start to make some of, some of these um, kind of more focused differentials as to as to what the bug is. At this point, I'm thinking it's most likely if it's going to be an infection, um, a bacterial infection, though I would consider mycobacterial and fungal also. Um, but I'm worried about his anatomy and a chronic bacterial infection. Right. Uh, how much, if at all, does the absence of fever, chill, sweat dissuade you from that? 
uh, helpful if it's present, but uh, doesn't really dissuade me um, if it's absent. And, you know, I don't know yet his immune status. You know, if he's immunocompromised, he may not mount a fever response. He's a little bit older. I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't argue against an infection strongly for me. Okay. So it sounds like you're, you're sort of going with this is a pretty nonspecific syndrome in a gentleman who's at predisposed to some things by virtue of what sounds like two different cancers. And maybe he's predisposed to something from the cancers, uh, if it's metastatic or it's got a paraneoplastic syndrome, but you're worried about distortion of his anatomy. Um, uh, aspiration or fistula formation, I guess, would be another possibility. And you're sort of looking for something a little more specific to hang your hat on. It sounds like maybe the scapular pain was the only thing there that you might want to run with. And that it sounds like that brought up the possibility that it's got an infection either where he's got pain or it's referred from some other place. Is that fair for where you are? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And hearing about leg pain uh, and back pain, do you have sort of, is there an epidural abscess reflex that automatically goes off there? It's certainly something that needs to be considered, um, and I would want more information and an, an exam and then potentially imaging, depending on, on what I get from that initial kind of couple of pieces of information. Okay, great. All right, let's go on. So we have a little bit more past history. <clears throat> He's got uh, a locally advanced supraglottic uh, squamous cell carcinoma. He's status post resection, trach, and peg, and status post-chemo. So we don't think he's on active chemo. His treatment was completed, and the trach was, in fact, decannulated and closed a year ago. He also has a second primary, it's believed, of esophageal uh, cancer, diagnosed two years ago, also status post-radiation, uh, currently on Pembro for the last three months. Uh, has history of COPD, has history of hypothyroidism, and has a history of generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, his meds are Synthroid, Sertraline, and Amitriptyline. Uh, his social history you see there, lives alone in an apartment, last traveled to a farm in Napa three years ago, uh, no prior encounters with shelters or prison systems, 60-pack year smoking history, quit three years ago, heavy alcohol use in the past, quit five years ago. Uh, actually, before we go there, any, any comments about anything you're seeing here? Uh, so a, a couple of comments, you know, as I mentioned, I always want to consider the non-infectious stuff. So I notice he's on thyroid replacement. Certainly in the setting of weight loss, that's something that will need to be checked. He's on a couple of antidepressants. Understanding a little bit more about his mood will be important as we consider etiologies for his weight loss. Um, and then he has a very significant smoking history, multiple cancers in the past. So that is something, something else that's going to need to be considered from a non-infectious uh, standpoint. Um, and then, you know, from an infectious standpoint, he's on pembrolizumab. That will put him at um, some higher risk for infection. And then we are learning a little bit about his anatomy. He got some radiation to his esophagus um, that, that may cause um, anatomic issues that could predispose him to esophagitis. Local spread of infection could spread, you know, multiple ways from there. And then the trach and peg history also is something that is an, an important history. It's encouraging that he's been decannulated and closed, but, um, you know, that there could be complications from that as well. So, so in terms of the, you mentioned aspiration being one thing you're concerned about, the fact that it's all been closed or even completed, does that let him off the hook from aspiration or you st would still see him at being at higher risk than the, an average person? I would still consider him at higher risk than an average person and, um, you know, would ask him some more questions around how he gets nutrition and, um, and, you know, whether he has any limitations on that, whether he's been evaluated for aspiration in the past. Okay. And then in terms of the uh, Pembro, um, for those of us that were trained in the pre-MAB era, we always, I think, have a hard time keeping straight, like how immunocompromised is he compared to other kinds of uh, treatment regimens for cancer? So can you comment on that? Yeah. So um, 
you're you're probably going to get a um, maybe a biased view from me because I do transplant ID, so I see people who are profoundly immunocompromised on a pretty regular basis. I would count him as moderately immunocompromised at higher risk for infections than somebody who who's not on that agent, but probably not at the degree of someone who's chronically neutropenic, recently transplanted, et cetera, where you're thinking about, you know, real opportunistic infections. And so I'm thinking more about kind of worse presentations of um, common types of infections like bacteria, et cetera, rather than kind of zebra type things. Okay. And these drugs do not predispose you to neutropenia or the other things that chemo does? Uh, not to the degree that would make me more concerned about things like um, uh, pulmonary mold or something like that. Okay. You know, to the really profound level. Got it. Uh, and you mentioned the thyroid. So your hit there was being on thyroid. He could be taking too much and could be hyperthyroid, explaining weight loss and, and weakness. Obviously, could Correct. be could be hypothyroid, explaining weakness as well. Um, and... Uh, farm in Napa three years ago. Any worry from that, or that's a that's a that's a nothing? I, I don't think it's likely to be a contributor to this case, but okay. um, you know, we uh, with a little more history, you know, if he had started symptoms three years ago, maybe I'd I'd be more interested, but um, it's probably unrelated. All right. Uh, so he had had a hospital admission a year and a half ago. Uh, during which he was admitted for an incidental finding of a right upper lobe cavitary lesion on a non-con CT that was done for lung cancer screening. Uh, he a, was a smoker at the time. Uh, the lesion had not been seen on another scan uh, three months previously. He had a broad infectious workup, and after that workup, the etiology was thought to be aspiration because the rest of the workup, as you see here, was negative including AFB, sputums, and PCR for tuberculosis, negative serum Crag, BDG, galactaman, and histo, uh, Coxi ID, quantifier on gold. His symptoms improved after uh, one to two weeks of antibiotics, and he remained on antibiotics for, uh, for three months. Over the next one and a half years, serial PET and CT scans acquired for cancer restaging showed uh, persistent right upper lobe cavitation, decreased hypermetabolism of the surrounding soft tissue rind, and resolution of some of the associated ground glass opacities and scattered pulmonary nodules. So let us stop there, and I'm happy to go back if you want to to that. So we now learn about him that although this is a new presentation with his symptoms, he did have some stuff that happened a year and a half ago that may or may not be relevant. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that he has had a presentation that is somewhat similar to this in, in the area where I'm worried about, you know, something going on in his lungs. So it sounds like he was um, asymptomatic at this well, I don't know. It's a little confusing because he was, it was an incidental finding, but his symptoms improved after one to two weeks. So I'd be curious to find out what those symptoms were at that time. He was probably told um, enough <laughs> times that he should have symptoms that eventually he did. <laughs> he he believed happened. it. Um, you know, he had, he had a broad workup for a cavitary pulmonary lesion. It was negative. He uh, showed improvement symptomatically and radiographically with treatment. And, you know, you can have a cavity that persists in the setting of treatment, you know, even appropriate treatment. And so that seems to be the suggestion of what's happened. Um, you know, the alternative would be that we didn't get the diagnosis and this is a chronic issue for him that is now having a flare. Um, that that seems less likely to me. It's been going on for a long time. He's been regularly surveyed, you know, getting getting frequent imaging and pets. Um, one would think that we would have picked up a progressive infection. So, you know, there are there are fungal infections and other types of infections that can, you know, have a negative serologic workup um, that that could have persisted and be a chronic infection. So. 
um, you know, I think that's a possibility. But what I'm more worried about is just that he, uh, this is kind of a sign that he aspirates um, and that he is at risk for other complications of, of that. So I would keep both possibilities entertained that either this is a chronic problem that maybe is having an exacerbation or progression at this point in the setting of, of recent uh, immunotherapy being added or, you know, other, other kind of possible kind of triggers, or this is a, a marker that he is at risk for complications of aspiration from, from his um, oral cancers. So let's, treatment. great, thank you. Let's take, uh, it sounds like you believe that the probability that this is a chronic infection and what we're seeing now is a worsening of that is very low for two reasons. One is all these negative tests and the second is the passage of time. Maybe the third is improvement in both symptoms and radiographic uh, appearance. So let me di dissect those a little bit. Can you take us through these lab tests, which is sort of the infectious cavitary lesion work, <laughs> rule out workup? And how good are they? Uh, you know, how convincing uh, are they in terms of sort of negative predictive value? Um, you know, sure. with all these things are negative. Are we, how confident are we that he doesn't have any of these things? Yeah. And I'll add the other point that we could have partially treated something before that now we stop treatment and is waking up to. Yeah. Like I'll, that's I'll, a, I'll, a kind of I'll add possibility. Yeah, I'll add, also add the other point that uh, we could be faking you out and you're an ID person, but there are other things that can cause cavitary lung lesions. Of course, absolutely. Um, and the ID people will be the first to say, consider non-infectious etiologies also. Um, okay. So, you know, going through the workup, uh, he had an evaluation for tuberculosis with sputum for AFB times three and two PCRs uh, for MTB. That has a really excellent negative predictive value, and um, especially for smear positive disease. But really, I think that they have effectively ruled out TB with that workup, especially given our pretest probability is relatively low. You didn't give me any epidemiologic risks or concerns that would make my pretest probability uh, higher. So, you know, I think the chances that this were t was TB it, are, is pretty low. Um, uh, serum CRAG is really an excellent test for cryptococcal disease, including pneumonia. So a negative test um, is, is very good for ruling that disease out. That can present with a, a pulmonary cavity. So it was good that they checked that. A BDD glucan is a really nonspecific serologic test for fungal infections. It is positive in many fungal infections. There's a couple of exceptions, including the zygomycetes and cryptococcus, actually. Um, we have more of a problem with it being uh, nonspecific, so having a positive when we are not expecting it and we don't suspect fungal infection than having kind of falsely negative tests. So, um, you know, a negative beta D glucan. It doesn't help me all that much other than um, saying, you know, maybe makes fungal infection slightly lower. And for those of so us that are, are, for those of us that are a few thousand years out from our micro course, uh, zygomyces, which ones are those? Uh, mucor would be the kind of classic mucor okay. and rhizopus. Um, Got it. Thank yeah. you. And, and I will mention beta D glucan has a, a, kind of the most helpful role for ID physicians is in helping to evaluate for PCP pneumonia, specifically in the setting of HIV. That's, uh, that's not what we're talking about here, but that's, that's where I find it the most helpful. Um, in other cases, it's uh, less obviously helpful. Um, we'll often send it in situations like this, um, but rarely is that the one key. Um, galactomannan is a test that's specifically looking for an antigen that's found in aspergillus. So when you're worried about invasive aspergillus, that's a, a serologic test that's non-invasive. It's quite specific. So if it's positive, it can be very helpful, but the sensitivity is fairly poor. So a negative test does not rule out aspergillus as an etiology for a lung nodule. Um, and if, if I were concerned, so say he had been neutropenic for three weeks at the time of this lesion and there were some specific radiographic findings that were concerning, 
the next step would be uh, getting a bronchoscopy with BAL and or a biopsy of the lesion um, to get kind of better testing. So you've given some uh, histoplasmosis, so, uh, both antigen testing and serologies with complement fixation. Um, in a, a relatively immunocompetent patient, a negative serology plus negative antigens um, really argue pretty well against disseminated histoplasmosis. There are some forms of kind of chronic localized histo that can be a little bit harder to diagnose. So these tests are a little less sensitive for those specific kind of um, very focal findings. Um, but you also haven't given me a huge exposure history for histo. I, I am I. I think we've effectively ruled it out here. Uh, COXI serologies are, are pretty good for COXI in an immunocompetent patient. He's had both immunodiffusion and complement fixation, so I, I feel good about that test as well. And then the quantiferin gold um, is often sent in the setting of a TB workup, but it is important to remember that uh, quantiferin can be negative in the setting of active TB. So, um, it neither rules in nor rules out uh, tuberculosis, um, though sometimes can be a useful clue if it's positive and your suspicion is high. Great. Thank you for taking us through that. Uh, Anna Fretz, one of the residents asked, uh, can you discuss how to interpret these tests in a setting if the patient had been getting chemo at the time? Does it, that change your interpretation at all? So some of the serology tests, um, so, you know, there's a kind of mix here of antigen tests where you're testing for the actual organism um, and then the serology tests where you're testing for the antibody. So that would be the histo complement fixation and the COXI immunodiffusion and complement fixation. So the antigen tests aren't going to necessarily be any worse. And in fact, they could even be um, more easy to detect in someone whose immune system isn't, isn't controlling an infection. Um, but the serologies, the, the antibody tests uh, may be a little bit less sensitive. Um, so for that reason, in our severely immunocompromised patients, for instance, uh, we do recommend sending a histo antigen in addition to the antibody tests, for instance. Okay, let's go on. It, so it sounds like you think it was a reasonable call to say we've pretty much ruled out all of those infections. The one infection we're sort of left with is aspiration. We'll treat with antibiotics, see how he does. He did okay, probably right. The fact that he improved makes it a little less likely it's a non-infectious cause, although probably still sits lingering a little bit back of your mind. Could it be something else? Uh, so let's go on and get some more info. Uh, he's afebrile. Vitals look pretty much fine. Uh, BMI is 11, weight 82 pounds. Cachectic poor dentition, high pitch, low volume voice with strained quality. Uh, heart exam is fine, no murmur, diminished breath sounds in the right upper lung field, no wheezes, crackles, bellies fine, neuro exam is benign. Uh, we'll assume that's a good exam of his legs and his back. Um, and we see hemoglobin of 9.7 and 12.5 uh, whites with 91% polys. Uh, light's okay-ish with a B1N of 30. INR 1.4, PTT 40, lactate 1.6, UA 10 white cells, Highland Cass. And now he gets on this admission now a non-con CT scan. We're looking at lung windows here and there's something on the right. And there's more stuff on the right. And there's even more stuff there. And the reading is increasing right upper lobe cavitation with surrounding rind of soft tissue, a layering nodule measuring 2.7 centimeters within the right upper lobe cavity. Uh, and let me see if we can see that. Maybe it's, I should have gone over this before. Maybe it's in there somewhere and um, multifocal ill-defined pulmonary nodules affecting all lobes. So let's turn back to the audience and ask the question, uh, what additional testing would you prioritize to make this diagnosis? And your choices are a CT scan of everything, a brain MR, 
another beta deglucan and galactamanin, the transthoracic needle biopsy, AFB workup again, smear and PCR, or a bronchoscopy. And it is looking like we have three quarters of people want a bronchoscopy. Uh, the rest of folks want other tissue from another direction with a transthoracic needle biopsy. Uh, only 5% of people want a CT of everything and nobody wants a brain MR, the beta deglucan or galactamanin, you talk people out of that. And, uh, and repeat AFB smear and, uh, and PCR. So let us turn to you and uh, see how you approach the new findings and labs and then maybe your reaction to what the audience seems to want. Sounds good. Can you go back to the CT for me, please? I sure can. And there's that, and there's that, and there's that. So I think we're honing in on the location of the problem that is likely to be causing the weight loss. So I will say I'm also, also a little bit worried about these pulmonary nodules, and um, he could have two processes of you know, recurrent cancer, complication of cancer plus an infection. Um, the first thing that I would do is to go walk to the chest radiology reading room and uh, take a look at this CT in comparison to his priors with the chest radiologist who are um, the, the very best at helping us think through the cadence of how quickly this developed and how it looks compared to the prior and can often really help us hone our differential diagnosis. So, you know, what I'm worried about here is one of two things. Um, one is either there was a pre-existing cavity from whatever happened 1.5 years ago, maybe some scarring, and we have now developed an infection within that cavity that is a new process. Um, so you can get fungal infections that develop within cavities, including aspergillus, um, that can potentially become either semi-invasive or angio-invasive. Um, you can get bacterial superinfections, you know, similar to a lung abscess as well. Um, and other types of infections um, are also uh, possible. So, you know, I would keep an open mind, but I would be kind of worried about bacterial and fungal causes. And then in the back of my head, I'm still, you know, wondering, could we have partially treated something back with that three months of antibiotics that has now chronically over t the past year gotten worse again. So, you know, thinking about a really chronic infection um, that would have been responsive to antibacterials. So something like nocardia or actinomyces or something like that, where it may have responded initially, knocked down the burden, and now it's kind of coming back up in the setting of, of some immunosuppression. So those would be kind of the two things that I'm thinking about. Um, and, you know, in reality, we're going to be sending some blood tests and probably thinking about a more invasive diagnostic procedure. And I agree with the audience that uh, getting our pulmonology colleagues to evaluate this patient and consider a bronchoscopy would be a good next step. Um, often, we're in discussions with the chest radiologist, the pulmonologist, um, about which, what's going to be the highest yield, a percutaneous biopsy versus a bronchoscopy, and what's the safest approach. Um, you know, I noticed this patient has COPD. Would there be any concerns with doing a bronchoscopy? Um, I don't know what, you know, if he, there are issues with oxygenation. He also has a cavity. Sometimes they don't want to stick a needle uh, into a cavity. So those would be discussions that, that we would be having with, with those services. Great. And then sort of in the, 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 um, in the this time course, is that a realistic time course that this is some chronic infection partially treated that then kind of sat around for a year and now is recrudescing now just because of bad luck and or his new chemo or something? Is that Do you ever see that length of time between the initial infection and, and this recrudescence, assuming it's the same thing? 
I think it argues against something like staff. You know, there are certain things that, uh, you know, are going to come back and be obvious uh, more quickly. But some of these more indolent infections um, can can stay around um, for a while and cause kind of more subtle findings over time. So a year is a bit long and, um, you know, so maybe makes it a little bit less likely, but I think it is possible that we partially treated something and now it's it's recrudescing um, okay. versus something new has set up in this area that was previously abnormal. Okay. And again, in the back of my head, I'm also worried about whether he could have cancer and then he's super infected that and that, you know, th this is now kind of an acute on chronic issue. So, I, you know, certainly that needs to continue to be entertained. And obviously you'd want to do non-invasive non things before invasive things. And yet you and the audience didn't, were not enthusiastic about redoing the TB workup, redoing the aspergillus workup to see if you could find something without sticking tubes in or needles in. Uh, is that because you just think the probability of those infections is so low, either as a super infection or a recrudescent infection, that they're, it's just not worth waiting the time to do it? You just need to have to go on and get tissue sooner? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm I'm worried that he'll progress without um, finding an answer and trying to address it. You're telling me his BMI is 13 and he's um, quite quite wasted already, and so getting an answer a little bit quicker um, is going to, you know, yield a quicker treatment and hopefully um, help help to turn that around. So. Getting all the non-invasive work up first is going to take a couple of weeks. These tests are often send out tests. They take a while to come back. And so, um, you know, you have to balance kind of the tempo with which this has developed over time and the level of concern for the patient with uh, the degree of invasion. So, um, again, I think having, having being able to review the tempo of how this developed would help me in that decision making. Um, and, of course, talking with the patient to understand um, their preference um, uh, in kind of that risk-benefit um, mm -hmm. measurement. But yeah, I'm absolutely. worried about him, so I think I would want a quicker answer than, um, than a non-invasive workup, which is likely to be lower yield. Yeah, that's really a good point. I mean, I think people, it's obviously if you could, the non-invasive workup would give you the answer, you'd love to avoid the invasion. But it sounds like the probability of, uh, of it giving you that answer is low here and the time is high and your worry that he's going to progress while you're waiting for it is reasonably high and you factor that all together and you move towards something more aggressive. That sounds, sounds right. Okay, let's uh, go on. We're reaching the end here. Um, okay, we have some additional data. They did send a bunch of stuff. The quantiferon gold negative, the beta glucan again negative, galactamanin again negative, coxy negative, histo negative, crag negative, sputum gram stain, rare yeast, oral flora, MTB, PCR negative, AFB, smear negative, urine culture negative, histo negative. Did have his brain MRI, no invasive, no evidence of invasive disease, some post radiation. Uh, changes are seen. Why don't you take us through how you interpret that data set? Yeah, and I didn't mention that um, the UA was positive. He, he has not told us any urinary symptoms, presumably has none. So uh, just want to make the point that uh, you're, even if the urine culture has bacteria, that is unlikely to be the cause that it's likely asymptomatic bacteria. Um, so as expected, you know, these, this fungal workup has been negative uh, a second time. Um, I mentioned that aspergillus is a possibility in the setting of this kind of prior cavity. Uh, the galactomannan is going to be less sensitive if it's not an angioinvasive form of aspergillus. So if it's kind of more a chronic invasive form, um, that test is, is not entirely sensitive. So I think that's still on the differential diagnosis. The sputum culture you're telling me has yeast in it. Um, the pathogenic yeast that I would worry about in the lungs would be cryptococcus. His crag is negative, so it is likely that that's going to be candida colonizing his, his um, pulmonary tree somewhere, and that is unlikely to be the cause of, of this. 
Um, he has oral nasal flora. You know, could he have aspirated and now have a an abscess in this prior cavity? I think that's still a possibility here. Um, though I am more, more worried about some indolent um, infections. And I, I think we still need, um, we don't have the answer yet. So I think we still need additional testing. When you talk about aspergillus and you talk about, it sounds like a chronic type where the, the uh, galactamanin is less, is a galactamanin less sensitive, the beta glucan or both? Uh, both are going to be less sensitive in that setting. But you mentioned before you didn't see him at being at particularly high risk for aspergillus. Do you still see that? Or once he has a cavity, that starts, that does set him up a little bit? Yeah. There's a spectrum of aspergillus diseases. The, the one that we all kind of worry about and think about a lot is angioinvasive aspergillus, where the host is typically someone with um, long-term neutropenia, meaning you know more than two weeks of an ANC less than 500. Someone in that category, or you know, really recently transplanted, um, he doesn't fit within that category. Where I'd be um, worried about that. But there are some other forms of aspergillus that can happen in patients with chronic lung diseases. Um, so you know, COPD. He's got this prior ab uh, cavity there. So there are these other chronic forms. Um, they have various names: chronic ne necrotizing aspergillosis. Um, is one of them, but those are kind of locally invasive, but not angioinvasive in the way that you worry about disseminating to organs far afield, but can cause um, local problems. And I think he's at risk for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's something that I would be considering. And I think, you know, getting, getting tissue or a BAL will be helpful for evaluating for that. There are some other aspergillus tests that could be sent, like the aspergillus precipitans test, um, which is kind of looking at the serologic response. Um, that may or may not be helpful. Probably not worth waiting for that test before getting more uh, invasive testing here. Okay. So it's time for your final answer in terms of what you think the test was and what you think it showed. Yeah. So... I think the test is going to be a BAL, and uh, I'm going to go with nocardia as being the diagnosis that was partially treated and now is coming back. But I think some kind of chronic infection here is is going to be the answer. So you, you, in terms of sort of categories, you're going. You sort of raise two hypotheses. One is sort of a super infection of this existing cavity that really was aspiration. And the second was something that was partially treated that it's the same thing that he's had for a year and a half year leaning on. It's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. And uh, just with uh, the question that we all grapple with all the time, the workup is ongoing. The tests are cooking. We'll get a BAL in a day or whenever. Are you starting him on broad spectrum anything? And if so, what at this stage? Yeah, that's a great question. A little hard to answer without laying eyes on him and seeing the progression over time from the prior and the length of time. If this has been going on for several weeks, and I think we're going to get an answer pretty soon, I may not start therapy while we're, while we're working on it. If, on the other hand, he seems quite ill and, you know, looks like he's getting developing respiratory distress or this developed, you know, over a very short period, then then I would be leaning on it, you know, broader empirical therapy. But because the differential here is um, fungal infection and bacterial infection, including, you know, atypical bacteria that that may require a little bit broader treatment. Um, you know, we're talking about pretty broad empirical therapy that, that may have some risks associated with it. So you're really, so in a, I, your, your branch point really is treatment or not. And if it's treatment, it's probably going to be aspiration drugs plus antifungals? Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and, you know, potentially also covering nocardia. You know, sometimes we'll cover nocardia plus bacterial stuff. That's pretty easy to cover those two. And then adding an antifungal, you know, thinking this, aspergillus is uh, on the differential here. For him, because I'm less worried about angioinvasive aspergillus, I may uh, withhold the antifungals while waiting for that piece of the workup, but treating for kind of an aspiration um, event while we're waiting for further workup is reasonable. Great. And one last qu question. 
Uh, briefly, sort of uh, those of us who don't know that much about nocardia, what would what are the risk factors, and does he have them? Yeah, um, so the risk factors uh, can be, you know, immunocompromised host and kind of a little bit maybe broader than your typical immunocompromised that I've been talking about with, you know, the real severe neutropenia. So I think he fits within that. Um, it, you know, sometimes there's risk factors with soil exposure, um, but those don't have to be present. It, it can be found in the environment. Um, okay. So I, I think he's at some risk uh, for nocardia. All right. I thought you were tying the thread of the Napa farm visit three three years ago together. But all right, let's go ahead and see what happened. So a diagnostic test return, and the test was a bronchoscopy. And the gross findings were injected vocal cords, friable mucosa, small amount of pus and purulence of the right upper lobe, no visible lesions. Initial BAL had 98% polys, no macrophages. Gram stain had uh, oral flora, epis, and white cells. KOH was negative. Bacterial culture, occasional ye uh, yeast. Fungal culture, rare mold, occasional yeast. Any comments about that? You told well, us to blow off, so. blow off the yeast before in the sputum, but how about this? Yeah. Well, so, um, you know, obviously I've been talking a lot about aspergillus, and that's that would make me concerned here. Um, occasionally we do say that mold is a colonizer, that's sometimes a little bit harder to make that call. But in patients with chronic lung diseases, you can have um, mold and other organisms that um, are sometimes pathogenic behave like colonizers. But given his clinical picture, I'm, I'm worried about this kind of middling aspergillus um, entity that I was talking about. Great. And, but the yeast doesn't do anything for you. It's the mold that, that gets you excited, ex excited here. <clears throat> Co correct. Yeast in the lungs, it, unless it's cryptococcus, is rarely pathogenic, even in immunocompromised hosts. It's you fine. know, of course, you can find exceptions to that rule. Um, and I've seen that in, in transplant patients, but it's pretty uncommon. Great. Okay. The BAL microscopy uh, showed uh, conidiophores. That's them on the left. Uh, uh, BAL aspergillus galactomannan was 9.67, normal up to 0.4. BAL bacterial and fungal cultures, aspergillus niger, did not speciate until many weeks after discharge. Upon finding pus purulence on bronch, started on IV and then PO antibiotics, this is empiric treatment for bacterial cavitary pneumonia. And while neither BAL, galactomannan, nor culture data were available at discharge, start on voriconazole, given the suspicion for aspergillus. Follow-up CT four weeks later showed worsening of the right upper lobe cavity. Given the lack of profound immunosuppression in pre-existing large pulmonary cavity, the most likely diagnosis was thought to be chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis. The disease you walked us through quite a bit. Thank you. Uh, when a combined surgical and medical approach was preferred, the patient was thought to be too frail to tolerate major thoracic surgery. He continued to receive azole treatment and is pending follow-up imaging with recognition that uh, medical therapy alone is insufficient, and you see all the services that he's following up with uh, there. So the final diagnosis is chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis, uh, which I thought your discussion was masterful and covered that uh, uh, in some detail, uh, let's bring on uh, uh, Fungdi Sun, who is our chief medical resident who prepared the case, to tell us a little bit about this entity, and then we'll take a few minutes at the end, Sarah, for you to comment on the diagnosis and the case and what we should take away from it. So, uh, Fungdi, why don't you come on, and I'll advance the slides for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the discussion, and I will say at the end, feel free to comment on these sort of teaching slides as well. Um, so as we've all alluded to, aspergillus is actually a relatively hardy fungus that grows as a mold. Um, while aspergillus fumigatus is the most common cause of invasive infection, um, in this case, we actually saw a different subspecies. Um, it's generally the most cause of invasive infection, but also specifically of infection of the lung. Um, and we see on the right here uh, an image excerpted from a very recent England Journal review on aspergillus infections in general, which is a great reference. Um, a good takeaway for us is that these spores are ubiquitous in the environment. And in most of us, when we inhale them, nothing happens. The vast majority don't cause measurable colonization. And when we talk about the spectrum of clinical manifestations that Sarah alluded to, 
Um, it really is dependent on the host immune response as was discussed. Oh, sorry, well, there we go. Wonderful. Um, so going through some of these clinical syndromes, we'll start first with one could argue the most benign. Um, so, you know, if you've ever heard of an aspergilloma, that's really just talking about having a specific quote unquote fungus fall in an existing lesion, uh, often cavitary lesion or structural lesion in the lung. Similarly, you can get uh, sort of colonization in the sinuses, um, as well as in the pulmonary tree without compatible radiographic findings that you might see. There is this phenotype of allergic syndromes um, where a patient um, likely due to predisposing factors has a hypersensitivity reaction to the aspergillus bug. Um, and most common here we hear about ADPA as well as allergic fungal sinusitis. Then there are these superficial invasive infections, things like onychomycosis, otitis externa, and then cutaneous disease. And then finally, um, in terms of this in semi-invasive or invasive category, um, we have chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, um, of which chronic cavitary pulmonary asp aspergillosis is sort of put into at times. Um, in contrast, there is the more angioinvasive pulmonary, sinus, and CNS disease, as was mentioned, and also disseminated disease, which can, in cases, include endocarditis. Overlaid upon that structure we just laid out are some of these risk factors that we've talked through to some extent. You'll see that structural lung disease comes in commonly for uh, many of these pulmonary manifestations. In terms of colonization without radiographic findings, we often think of patients with impaired mucociliary clearance, so patients with bronchiectasis or cystic fibrosis. Um, thinking about cutaneous disease, tissue damage and burns are often thought of. And then for our patient, interestingly, some of the risk factors for chronic pulmonary aspergillosis include structural lung disease, malnutrition, as well as underlying cancer. Um, and then finally, thinking towards sort of the most extreme end of things, the angioinvasive and disseminated infections, we really think about the degree of immunosuppression. The more immunosuppressed a patient is, you know, the more concerned these potentially come on to. Um, some of these are sort of intrinsic immunosuppression. Others are exogenous for medications or stem cell transplant. Um, and then another one I'll just put on there, and Sarah can feel free to comment on this later, is that um, severe respiratory viral infections such as influenza and even uh, most recently SARS-CoV-2 have come up as potential risk factors for aspergillus infection. Um, this will go through quickly in that we talked much about it, um, but tissue biopsy and really histopathology of that tissue is thought of as the gold standard in terms of showing invasion of the organism. Um, another point I just want to make there is that um, it really is, as with all our other tests, thinking about the clinical pretest probability of a patient having the condition and correlating that even with tissue biopsy, particularly if you're taking from a non-sterile site. Um, in this case, we got a BAL fluid, BL fluid studies of which some are listed there. Um, and from my understanding, it's that BAL galactamin, which in this case was fluidly positive, is less dependent on host factors compared to the serum studies as were discussed. Um, and then again, just a quick review that the beta D glucan is more sensitive, but not uh, specific with some notable false positives, including the cellulose membranes in um, hemodialysis, as well as things like IV albumin, IVIG, um, and some antibiotics. Whereas for uh, galactamanin or in some hospitals literally called aspergillus galactamanin, um, more specific, does have some, I think, cross-reactivity with other fungi, but rare, um, and has increased sensitivity with increased neutropenia. And then lastly, and we're not gonna go into sort of complex therapy decisions here, but it, it really is a range. So a simple aspergilloma might require no therapy, um, but if you are thinking about therapy, systemic antifungal agents are really the azole, so voriconazole and isobuconazole are two that are mentioned. In this case, our patient actually ended up on a once daily posaconazole due to concerns about his ability to take oral medications. Um, and then comes the question of, does this patient need a procedure? So consideration of surgical debridement for many um, fungus balls as well as wound and cutaneous infections. 
And then when we think about angioinvasive disease and potentially concern for hemoptysis, potentially more urgent embolization or surgical resection. Also with a comment that if you have a really large cavity with a large burden of necrosis, there might be concern about penetration of systemic antifungal agents. Um, and then balancing risks and benefits. In certain cases, we can reduce the immunosuppression, possibly helpful, but tricky decisions all around. Great. So uh, let's give you, Sarah, a few minutes for reflections. For those that want uh, CME credit, I'll have a slide up that takes you to the website, including the, uh, the barcode and a few references as soon as Sarah is done. But Sarah, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, first, Fondi, that was an excellent review of um, Aspergillus. So um, thank you for, for walking everyone through that. Um, you know, my my first thoughts on reflecting kind of, you mentioned some steps after he got diagnosed that he has a worsening cavity, surgery was considered. Um, some of the things that I just wanted to mention are, um, there was a recent randomized trial comparing voriconazole to posaconazole for treatment of uh, invasive aspergillus that showed um, that they're equivalent for treatment or not, non-inferior um, for posaconazole and that patients who get posaconazole had fewer side effects. Um, voriconazole can be very difficult to take. There are some um, side effects, uh, GI side effects, but occasionally it can cause kind of this diffuse bony pain um, from increased fluoride levels. Um, it can cause LFT abnormalities. And then some patients are uh, rapid metabolizers, so it can be very hard to actually get the drug levels at therapeutic levels. So one thing when you mentioned that he hadn't responded, the first kind of instinct I had was, do you have appropriate drug levels? And, you know, maybe posaconazole, which um, in its uh, pill formulation is easier for patients to take and get um, good drug levels would be a good alternative. So, you know, when I'm thinking about him not responding to initial treatment, I think the burden of disease and the, the fact that he's so malnourished and the fact that there's necrotic tissue certainly needs to be considered. And I think getting surgery to evaluate is appropriate, though it sounds like he wouldn't be a good candidate. But I would also be thinking about that treatment um, approach. And, um, you know, I think uh, this, he may live with this. Um, I, I'm not sure that this will be uh, life limiting for him. And, you know, he's at risk for hemoptysis. Um, he may have further wasting that may, may cause problems. It may limit his treatment for the malignancy, which, um, you know, it sounds like he's got a good team working together um, on, on these really complicated issues. Great. Any, and any final reflections on the diagnostic process? And if we call you again to do this, would you say, that's great, I'm excited, or, oh, my God, it's really hard? <laughs> um, Oh, it's really hard to do this in front of a big crowd, for it sure. Is hard. It really um, is yeah, but um, you know, it's a, it was a very interesting case. I think it brings up a lot of um, important issues. When, you know, when you're thinking about the the host and the kind of syndrome and and what might be causing an infection, um, kind of thinking through that process, this was a good a good case um, to illustrate some of that thinking. Yeah, well, I, I thought. You did superbly, as did uh, funding the discussion. And uh, just, I mean, if, unless you've been in this position of trying to think out loud in front of 100 or however many people and worried about you missing something, and it's it's hard to do. So you did beautifully. And, you know, the points about the chronicity and understanding and thinking about the test characteristics of all these tests, do they really rule out the thing? or And then the timing of getting more invasive because you really may not have time to wait. Uh, those are all really important teaching points uh, around around uh, what I think is also a very, very interesting case. So thank you for doing this. Uh, those of you who uh, follow Grand Rants next week again, a COVID conference with Paul Offit talking about vaccines and George Rutherford. Um, we have a slide thanking you with uh, uh, these very funny things that appear in a Mission Local, a local paper that uh, writes up our Grand Rounds like a sporting event. Um, and yes, we said for amazing discussion, even before the discussion, but we thought it was a good, good bet. And so we, and we were right. Uh, those of you interested in CME credit, please hang on. And uh, here are some references if you want to uh, see more, including uh, some uh, good review articles in the New England Journal. Leave that up for about 10 seconds, and then I will take you to the slide that'll show you how to get CME credit. Uh, but thank you uh, to both of our speakers, and uh, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week.